Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dan Caldwell, a lung doctor. I'm in Cleveland. Uh, it's amazing how many sarcoidosis centers are in Ohio. I don't know why it's like that. But anyway, uh, it's convenient to get together with these guys. Um, they've asked me to talk about the future of research. And I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what the future is going to bring. But I, I have some ideas and thoughts about it. And I, I think this doesn't, this sounds a little bit cliched, but I would say that the most important thing in sarcoidosis research is not here or over there, it's right here. You guys are the most important thing in sarcoidosis research in the future. And that's for a few reasons. Number one, yeah, you guys are as well aware as anybody, this is under-recognized, under-funded, under-cared about, under-studied, not enough drugs, thank you. And people don't even know the word most of the time. Right? So advocacy is not just a buzzword for you guys. We heard talks this morning about things like multiple sclerosis, psoriasis. Those are important diseases. They cause lots of problems. There are plenty of people working on those. There are plenty of funding for those. I shouldn't say plenty, but there's a lot more than there is in sarcoidosis. So it's up to all of us, me, Ginger, Kelly, all of you guys, to say, I'm going to do my part and try to push research forward. So what does that mean, practically? It means engaging. So if you're just curious, I know you guys probably just got the card and you were older, but how many people are part of the registry? Okay, that's fabulous. That's about probably about half of you. Now some of you are family members and probably some of you aren't, but if we don't talk about how many of you there are, if we don't talk about how it affects people, if we can't go to the NIH and the FDA and pharma and say, this many people have the disease, and no, it doesn't just go away. It causes real problems. People won't care. So my motto for the registry is, stand up and be counted or you won't count. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, you can talk to your congresspeople. You can talk to your local hospitals. You can even organize things yourselves. And Kelly right there is help, happy to help anybody who wants to get engaged. But I always tell patients when they come into my waiting room and say, well, I didn't like the TV channel that was on, and I didn't like how long I had to wait, and this and that, and things would be better, and I have an idea. I say, look, they listen a lot more patients than they do to me. They're tired of listening to me. So you guys have a lot of power. You have much more power than you think you have call up that congressperson and call up that person at the hospital or the ombudsman and say, I have sarcoidosis and you need to listen to me. That's really, really important. The other thing is, a lot of the research in sarcoidosis is moving into thinking about what your experience is. Right? When you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, your vital capacity is 78% today, that's pretty good. X-ray status stage two, okay, that's, that's not a number four. We can be happy with that. Does that have anything to do with whether or not you can get through the grocery store the next day without stopping for a break? Does that have anything to do with toxicities of the prednisone you were on? It's got nothing to do with it. So fortunately, the medical field is starting to get much more interested in what you guys are doing. That means that patient-reported outcomes, instruments that look at quality of life, how do you feel, how do you function, how do you survive, those are becoming very important in studies. Patient input into studies is really becoming important. And this is not just lip service. This is really, really happening. And patient engagement in the research arena is becoming much more important. The European Respiratory Society is working on a new document that's a new guideline for sarcoidosis. And guess who has a big seat at the table? Guess who's helping frame the questions? Patient groups, patients and patient representatives. Ginger is part of that, actually. So the voice of the patient is really coming into things. Now, we're still waiting for the FDA to say, we approved drug X because it made the patients feel better, not because it made the force of capacity better. We're going to put the patient reported outcomes on the top. But that stuff is coming there. That is getting to be a part of it. So I think that that, at least if I read it, maybe I might think that that's pretty exciting. Um, I think the outcomes are going to be looked at a little bit differently. Instead of looking at things like doctors like to measure, like your vital capacity, we're going to be looking at whether people can do more, uh, whether they're 
cost of care is more cost effective. It doesn't mean we're going to be cheap or chintzy. It means we're going to try to look at how the whole picture is. So cost of steroids versus the benefits of steroids. We have to look at those as a double-edged sword. I also think we're going to see clinical trials change a little bit. How many of you have been involved in any kind of clinical research in sarcoidosis where you've had to sign an informed consent? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not very many. Three, maybe four. Okay, so there are observational studies. Those are pretty easy to do for the most part. And those just mean we're going to collect some information. So I asked your doctor, how can I get involved with the trial? Go to the FSR website and ask, where are trials going on? How can I get engaged with those things? Drug companies look at you guys and they say, is this a population? Is this a group of patients who wants to move things forward? And to do a clinical trial now costs about between $100 million and $200 million. And it sounds like that's not very much money for GSK or for Bristol Myers or Pfizer. And in one way, it's not. But believe me, they're calculating all that stuff. And if they say we're putting down $150 million and we can't develop a trial, guess how many more sarcoidosis trials they're going to do in the future? And they talk to each other. Do you think Pfizer's going to do one if it fails with Roche? Probably not. So look into getting involved in trials. Now, trials have been tough because they have very stringent criteria. Now, who can be in, who can't? If you're left-handed, but you're over the age of 40, and your vital capacity is not a good number, then you're not in the trial. Okay? That's changing a little bit. There's this concept of large, simple trials that are starting to become more prevalent. And part of that relies on just what is done, done in real-world practice. So we may look at everybody who's treated with methotrexate and everybody who's treated with azathioprine and say, looking across several hundreds or even several thousands of patients, how many of those people end up with some problem? Whatever we want to measure, how many times did they go to the doctor in the year? How many ER visits do they have? How many blood tests do they have to have? And you can imagine that in an era of everything being computerized, there are big data out there. And there are search engines and ways to farm that big data and to ask of all the methotrexate users and all the azathioprine users, do they start to look similar? So big data farming and also this concept of large, simple trials where you might come in, instead of just doing 100 tests like you like to do in a trial, just you're going to be on drug A, you're going to be on drug B, and we're going to see what happens, and we're not going to get more proscriptive than that. So those are a couple of things that I think are coming down the pipe here. Right, so I guess that doesn't give us very much time to for slides. <laughs> I'll just show you a couple of things. I want to show you a little bit. This is more about the, the <coughs> understanding of biology of sarcoidosis. And this is a cartoon we made a couple of years ago about some of the compounds and molecules and stuff that are involved in sarcoidosis. And it's complicated. Okay? And we made these pictures, and I put some more letters and numbers in there to make it even more complicated. Um, so there's some kind of an immune reaction, the green lung is formed, and all of those things are targets. And the reason we need to know the biology of the disease is so we know what to target with therapeutics, because not everything is going to work well. And we think we kind of have a picture of the bad guys, right? We know exactly who it is. It's that green lung causing agent. And all we have to do is knock out the right bad guy, and we've got it. But you know what's behind every bad guy? An even worse guy. Okay? <laughs> so we can make the picture even more complicated, and I think every sarcoidosis review has one of these pictures where there are complicated numbers of targets. And one of the challenges for us as scientists is to think about which ones of these are really important and which are just kind of long for the ride. Because taking out something that's long for the ride isn't as important as taking out a linchpin, right? So let me show you a couple things about that. Number one, there's this thing called Th17 cells. And we've learned lately that those are pretty important for producing a cardinal molecule of sarcoidosis, the interferon gamma. And this is a complicated cartoon, and I don't want to go through it, but I want to just say that we're learning more about the cells that are involved. Who are the players, and what are they making? And the more we study this and go back to the same thing, it's like reading a book again. Have you ever read a book twice? Did you get something else different out of it the second time? We're learning new things when we go back to what we thought were fundamental premises. 
The other thing, this is LA school, really. And this is something that's very cool. I may say, look, I think interleukin-12 is the most important thing in the world, and I'm going to do a study. That's how we've always done it, right? You think about it in a sports analogy, right? And I think having a good running back is the most important thing to an NFL team. And if you don't have a good running back, why, who are you guys Eagles fans out here? You miss out good running back? Wow. I can't talk anything about this because I'm not going to believe it.
12 that I've never even thought about before. And it turns out to be way more than linchpin. It turns out that having a shut down cover corner is the most important thing. And we didn't even know it until we did an unbiased approach. So now I'm going to stop there and say that we have some challenges. This is not just one disease, but it's multiple diseases. There is variability between populations. We have to think about are we studying patients at the beginning of their disease or at the end? Are we studying them in Sweden or in Japan? Are we studying lung disease? Are we studying peripheral blood? Are we studying what goes on in the eye? And then we have to work on developing a model so we can model some of these things. And in fact, Dr. Krauser is very unclear about this, but he was one of the three award winners for a model. The other two were in England and in Vienna uh, of sarcoidosis. So I think this is a very exciting time. I really think you guys are very much becoming front and center in this. I really encourage each of you to pick up the phone. And people still use envelopes. Get out an envelope. <laughs> However it is, you know, I mean, it's um, okay, but do whatever is equivalent to getting out an envelope today. And, and, and try to pick up the banner and go with it as far as you can. And of course, the first step is that you're all here. So again, thank you for the invitation. I know this is run over. At least I didn't have a fire alarm to deal with. <laughs> <laughs>